Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Brass Junkies. I am one of your hosts, Andrew Hitz, and I am joined by the lovely, inspiring, and affable, always affable, Lance LaDuke. How are you doing this afternoon, Lance? <laughs> <laughs> that is that yeah, is um, that is going to um that is gonna make sense to you in uh in <laughs> In just a second, and uh, not the way some of you are thinking. We, <laughs> the our our oh no, we are uh, our guest today is um, is one of the best trumpet players in the world, um, and that's not self proclaimed. That's like other trumpet players acknowledge that uh, it is the great principal trumpet of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, Andrew Balio, and um, the reason why Lance just. Um, uh, just bad like a sheep. There um, is not. Uh, we had an extensive uh, discussion with Andrew about cloning and the ethics of cloning and um, and the future of cloning. No, we didn't. Um, he's actually uh, his uh, his wife is very big into knitting, and uh, they are uh, at the the Sheep and Wool Festival, which is um, which is west of uh, Baltimore every year uh, in Maryland. And um, so so as you will hear, the first like. <laughs> The first the jokes half hour forty minutes of uh yeah of the um of the interview there's like loud sheep noises which is hilarious and it actually kind of freaked me out because within fifteen minutes I wasn't even noticing them and then there was a couple of times when I noticed that I wasn't noticing which I thought was hilarious and then I just was randomly smiling so uh, if you hear me smiling through a question and there doesn't seem to be any context for anything being funny it's because I just all of a sudden noticed that I wasn't noticing the sheep noises so. Um. Yeah. That ha- you never know what you're going to get out of the brass junkies, do you, Lance? Never ever. Yeah. <laughs> and we <laughs> and we meticulously plan every episode out, so it's weird that there's always so much variety. So, Joe Alessi wait st- standing like with his like fu- like on a chair to get better Wi-Fi signal outside of an elevator bank in um you know in in Vail, Colorado, or Andrew Balio at a uh, <laughs> at a sh- surrounded by literally thousands of sheep. Uh, in rural Maryland, um, yeah, you, you just never know. So, uh, <laughs> the um, why don't you uh, give the people a quick uh, a Patreon spiel, and then we will get on with our uh, discussion with uh, Maestro Balio. Hey, people. <laughs> hey, sheeple. <laughs> Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, is a super quick, easy, way helpful way that you can support our show. We have a number of costs associated with uh, producing and uploading and hosting the shows and, and wool stuff to go with it and wool. Oh my gosh, <laughs> sheep! I mean they they don't shear themselves, people. <laughs> so if you are interested in uh, finding a way to help us, you can do so by going to Patreon dot com and uh, type in. Well, you can do the Brass Junkies, uh, Patreon dot com forward slash the Brass Junkies, or you can search the Brass Junkies when you get to Patreon, and you can decide to give one, two, three, five, ten, a thousand dollars episode. <laughs> you want to give a thousand bucks an episode? We hey, no, hold on, you. a thousand bucks an episode. If you do that for a full year, then uh, Lance and I will actually purchase a sheep somewhere mm-hmm. and we will uh we will shear it ourselves we will then make that into into yarn and we will then knit you a sweater mm-hmm. that's that we need Guaranteed. to we need to add that as a uh as, as one of the reward levels on uh level exactly yeah. <laughs> that's a great idea for, right boy i can hear the people <laughs> signing up right now <laughs> uh, if you decide to contribute at less than the thousand dollar level we are still more than happy to have you do so you can put an upper limit on how much you contribute over the course of a month or over the course of a year you can start at stop at any time and it's a huge help to us we uh we don't we we go in the hole every year every year in in all of the year <laughs> we've been doing this <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, we're, we're sort of paying out of our own pocket, not sort of, we're paying out of our own pocket to, uh, cover the cost cause we 
believe in what we're doing and we're having a heck of a good time and we're very excited to get to talk to uh, folks like Mr. Valio. Um, but if you would like to help us with that cause, boy, that'd be great. And that's a super easy way to do so. And it's, uh, you know, if you do a buck, it ends up being about 26 bucks a year and it's a big, big uh, difference for us. So thank you for considering that and thanks for being a fan. And just to be clear, like $500 an episode, you ain't getting a sweater. So um, we'll, we'd buy you a sweater, but we're not knitting We're not knitting you one. Since do you know how to knit, Lance? Uh, yeah. <laughs> he just said, he said, yeah, because he has, because uh, he macrame. can look it up on YouTube. <laughs> I could do macrame. Macrame, um, good. How crochet, about, but not knitting. What about uh, paper, or, um, paper mache? Mm-hmm, paper mache, no problem. Yep, yep. yep. There you go. That stuff's all coming with Nicholas. It's not here yet. So, uh, all right. Uh, I think that that is it. Do we want to talk about uh, anything like heavy valve caps or? Um, it's a good know, name for a band. Um, Ambusher shifts or uh, anything Another like good that name for a yeah, band. Yeah, there you go. All right. Well, without further ado, and people are like, yeah, maybe next time a little less of doing. Uh, without further ado, here is our conversation with Andrew Balio of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. All right, and today, today we are, yes, those are sheep in the background. Today we are joined uh, by one of the great trumpet players in the world. A lot of trumpet players uh, call themselves that, but this one actually is. Uh, this is uh, Andrew Balio of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. How are you today, Andrew? Oh, I'm go- doing great. And, um, and you're calling us from the middle of uh, thousands of sheep. Can you explain to us where you are? Oh, so I married a knitter, and with knitters uh, come a lot of sheep and linen and folk music. And, uh, yeah, so uh, we're spending our Saturday out in the middle of a, a big uh, county fair, and I'm, uh, I'm in the sheep barn where we're, you know, look, my wife's looking for the perfect sheep. <laughs> There you go. That's a. This is gonna be. This is gonna be great because there's already like the very beginning of it just had loud sheep noises. So uh, I, there it is. I love it. Oh, it's hilarious. So um, you have one of the most fascinating bios of anyone that uh, we have interviewed. Um, it's it's incredible all the things that you've done in a in a, in a short period of time. Um, when did you start playing with the Baltimore Symphony? In uh, end of two thousand one. And what were you doing before that? I was with the Israel Philharmonic for nearly a decade, uh, which was uh, that was a tremendous job because we were tra- traveling three months of the year on tour with Zubin Mehta and various other wonderful conductors. Uh, and so, yeah, it was just it was much a lot of life on the road. And when we were back in Tel Aviv, we were playing six, maybe seven concerts a week. My my first month I was there, I played twenty four concerts. Wow. Yeah, it's just like a factory. And so it, you know, Israel is an example of a country where there's, there's, historically there's been unlimited demand for classical music, if you can imagine. But hmm. that's, that's owing to the culture. Is that these people just to thrive on classical music. Wow. And before that, you were in Mexico, correct? Yes. My first job was in a Mexican orchestra. I played there for four years in uh, Orquesta Sinfonica del Estado de Mexico, if any of any other trumpet players out there, of which I imagine there are many who are alumni of that orchestra in, in Toluca, Mexico. It's around 9,000 feet above sea level. Nice thin air for running out of gas in the middle of a phrase. <laughs> and uh, yeah, where it rains precisely at 2.30 every single day. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was, the, that was the job that put my face together. Uh, it was just such a challenging job. Uh, Jim Thompson was principal there years before I was there. Tim mm-hmm. Morrison had been a predecessor. Um, all sorts of great players came through there, and um, because it was it was a great job, we played so much repertoire. Uh, a typical program would be Sibelius second as the opener. Second half would be Shostakovich five, and then we play Wapango as an encore. Wow. Yeah, at nine thousand feet, that will get that'll either get your face together or it will probably make you seek a different line of work. Would be my guess. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> yes, I remember my first week there. It was just huffing and puffing. It was, it was tough. I did NRO uh, in Breckenridge, Colorado, uh, close to twenty years ago now, um, and uh, the first piece on the program was uh, um, pictures at an exhibition. And uh, the trombones, uh, Jamie Box, who's in Montreal, and Steve Lang, who's in Boston. It was an incredible section to play with. But we got to the catacombs the first time, and 
hit those chords and they were huge and they all had these great big huge diminuendos on them <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> yeah it was it was pretty funny we were like wow this is not easy so um and uh so where did you grow up madison wisconsin and you um your bio says that you um performed with the milwaukee symphony when you were quite young how did that come about Oh, it's just a typical youth or youth competition where they line up a bunch of youngsters and they all give it the best shot. And uh, I managed to get my way through the Haydn Concerto to get, in, you know, to uh, get. I think it was around two hundred dollars scholarship that I applied towards music camp. A two hundred dollars scholarship would get you probably about ten minutes of one college course today. Yeah, so. now, nowadays, yeah, back <laughs> back in those days, yeah, music camp was much cheaper. But yeah, it all it all added up. It was uh, sure. Um, it was one of those nice things that we do for kids with orchestras. Who were your major teachers? Well, I was very fortunate. Gene Young was my first uh, really serious teacher that got into it with me. He was an old Vacchiano student who had moved on to conducting. But back in the day, he was trumpet professor at Oberlin. And he had all sorts of great students. So he's highly respected as just, you know, someone that predates so many of, you know, m- m- most people don't, you know, remember him as a trumpet teacher. But I was very lucky. And, and I, had, uh, I had beaten down his door to give me trumpet lessons because he was no longer even playing. And uh, so I was his only student for a while. And, uh, and I was his last student also. And, you know, so he would spend four hours each lesson with me, just picking through stuff, teaching wow. me transposition really slowly, um, explaining all these different styles to me. So he, he, he reached me in a very, uh, very profound way when I was, I guess I was 14 when I started with him. So he really turned my life around, and I, I learned just how, how important it is to have not only a great teacher, but, but a, a really great relationship with a teacher. Um, and I think that's I think that's something that's sort of lost on the young younger generations. They tend to do the buffet style where they they hit all the teachers once um, mm-hmm. and they go to the master class and they think that it's about the information. And I I would disagree. I think it's very much about the relationship and just sort of absorbing through osmosis, you know, the ways of uh, you know of a, of a you know wise teacher. So he he was um, very dear friends with. Uh, Charlie Schluter and Tom Stevens, they had all been at West Point together back in you know, New York you know, um, when they were all studying with Vacchiano. And so at that point in at high school, he had got, me, got my playing going well enough that he, was, he really wanted me to study with Tom Stevens or, or, or Charlie. And Charlie at that point was um, just in the next state over. He was at the Minnesota Orchestra, so that seemed you know, like something I could work out. Then Charlie got the Boston job and I immediately... Um, you know, started trying to uh, get into Tanglewood. So I, I started going to Tanglewood, you know, in the Kitty program when I was 14 and uh, played in the EBQ seminar when uh, um, when the Empire Brass Quintet was going full blast and had Norman Bolter was playing trombone in it and Rolf and uh, Charlie Lewis. It was just ridiculously amazing. What year was that? That was 81. I was uh, I did the EBQ seminar as a 14 year old in 1990. Okay, so, okay, so you know what I'm you know what I'm talking I about. I do. Yeah, it was l- life changing. Yeah, well, they would just you know they would just they go start over and had an open rehearsal and they'd play down the Etler flawlessly, <laughs> play down some Baroque piece flawlessly, an uh, uh, Ewald quintet, and it was just you know it, it was not just my young ears. They really were that amazing, and um, so that was. Uh, yeah, that, that was a, a formative experience, and I was, so I was trying to beat a path to eventually to study with Schluter, um, and he, you know, I'd got lots of lessons with him in the summers at Tanglewood when I was playing the youth orchestra, and um, and, and of course Tom Stevens was always in the background. He, uh, I, I would go hear them when they were on tour and try to, you know, just talk to Tom Stevens. <laughs> it was it was it was it was very hard to you know get time with him because he just you know he just wasn't having any of it. <laughs> I, I remember I, I had read in a Louis Davidson book that Tom Stevens had practiced ten hours a day when he was a student. He think he'd written that down. So I um, I asked him, Mr. Stevens, how, I'm I get tired after two hours I and mean, I can't play anymore. He goes, Why you don't take breaks? 
<laughs> so, so, so I didn't understand. I thought the, I thought you have to just sit down for ten hours. But and uh, because, and I thought I thought I was never going to get anywhere because I was already on my teeth at one hour, and then I could you know limp across the, you know to the second hour. But uh, yeah, so so yeah, he he would just you know make a few offhand remarks, and that, that was that. So yeah, I never ever got to study with him <laughs> because he just you know he was. Uh, it was always sort of like get lost kid, but but then many years later, I was playing a joint concert with LA Philharmonic when I was with Israel Phil, and it was I think it was Zubin's uh, birthday, some one of one of the big years, and so we were all playing together. And Tom had or just retired, but he came to the rehearsal, and I was playing this this uh, Monet Samadhi trumpet. And, that, and he was fascinated by that. He wanted to see, he wanted to hear someone actually play one of these things. Cause he he was actually an old fan of Dave Monette's, but uh, he had uh, um, he wasn't you know entirely you know he he wasn't he didn't end up playing on these things. So so then so then he followed me off stage when I was uh, playing the Leonore call. He wanted to hear how this thing sounded. <laughs> so and then he then it was wonderful. Then he took me for a drive. Um, all around LA, you know, through the mountains and stuff, and we spent an afternoon together, and it was just, it was a perfectly lovely time. And he said, you know, call me anytime. And really so great. So I, I called him, and the, the number was disconnected. And, uh, <laughs> and then, that's so why I sent him an email because I thought there's something wrong with his phone, and the email bounced back. And <laughs> that, was, that was that. But uh, yeah, but I, I grew up listening to lots of Tom Stevens records. Um, Charlie Schluter records when he was with the Minnesota Orchestra, and back in those days, all the radio stations. Oh no, no, I don't mean that. I mean all the orchestras would broadcast one one day of the week. So if you had, uh, you know, a good, um, you know, radio station like from uh, uh, it was WFMT from uh, from Chicago, every night of the week I could hear um, one of the major orchestras playing. So that's that's really how I learned so much about orchestral to actual live performances on the radio every night, which was, it was such a, an incredible thing to be able to do. And of course, I guess kids can do that now uh, with, the, with the internet. We have lots of that. So I think everybody's keeping tabs on everyone these days. So you were able to uh, take advantage of a lot of very cool opportunities as a youngster. So were your parents musical? I mean, how did they understand that you were special and that these were opportunities that they needed to let you uh, take advantage of? Well, it was, uh, they, uh, I was, they had no clue that I was musical at all. Um, they, they had no reason to think that I was because it was a real about face from all the other things I was doing as a kid. But, uh, and I, I don't think they thought I was special. So that, in a sense, that that made it all the better because it was really my thing. They weren't pushing me at all. My mother played piano and my father listened to opera. And I had a grandfather who listened to, he'd been listening to opera ever, you know, ever since the first days that it was being broadcast. So he was fanatical about, about that. But now, you know, I'm certainly the first musician, musician in the orchestra, in the, um, in the family. But uh, they... Uh, yeah, but they I mean, obviously I, supported it. I mean, you were you got to go do some very cool things as a as a young guy. Yeah, to, yeah, to the extent that my to the extent that they could, um, I, I, you know, I was I was mowing hundreds of lawns, shoveling everyone's sidewalk, babysitting for everyone, working on farms, a uh, little bit of construction, cleanup work. Um, yeah, I did tons of odd jobs, and uh, so I was, I was rather entrepreneurial in that sense. So I, you know, to pay for all the music camps and trumpet lessons, I was. That was what was called for. So again, it was it, it was it was my thing, and I, it was something I worked to, uh, you know, to do. So I didn't have them interfering. If I would if it, if they had been pushing or had some agenda with it, I'm sure that would have been a, you know, it would have triggered the inevitable rebellion of some sort. So I was, uh, you know, so so I, I often caution parents against getting too invested in the music because then it becomes their their agenda, not the child's agenda. Right. Hmm. Well, there, you you have um, kind of hinted at it, a tenacity you know, to stick with a teacher for a long period of time and to uh, take a four-hour lesson and to do all of those odd jobs to pursue this thing. Is that a thing that you feel like you were... Is that a thing you just had? I mean, how did you know that the stick to itiveness was going to be the way? I guess... Where I'm going is it feels like a lot of students, you were talking about the fact that students will do the, the, the 
revolving door and they'll go try this mm -hmm. teacher for a lesson, I'll try that teacher for a lesson. And I want to, my hunch is there's a correlation between those are the ones that uh, cause trumpet players to have all the bad jokes about how many mouthpieces do you have. Yeah, stick, exactly. Rather than stick with one <laughs> thing. So do you feel like this has uh, been a uh, recurring theme for you and just in terms of the stick to it? -ness? Well, that's the way it was back then. I'm, I'm old enough that that was that there was still, um, you know, work ethic was um, certainly emphasized in my family. My father was an extremely hardworking guy. All the men in my family were were that, and uh, none of us thought we were particularly smart anyhow. So we we figured it was only hard work that was going to get us over you know, whatever we needed to do. So I was just bitten by the love of music like so many people. I that was I was simply what I wanted to do. I was going to do that. And I didn't you know, I also didn't feel like I had that many other options either. I wasn't particularly good at anything else. So, you know, and I had that you know, I see some of these youngsters who um they're they're too talented. They have all these abilities and, you know, all these options and then it ends up diluting things so i was i was extremely focused once i picked my direction i i practiced my butt off i um you know i, I just listened to tons of recordings at the local music library would go to the public library and borrow records there um it's just a, it's a time-honored tradition when a when a, a young player um, becomes obsessed with something. So the, I was never on the clock. It was just it was just twenty four seven interest in learning about classical music and you know and uh, what the trumpet's role was in all these things. And uh, so uh, yeah, I, I know there's entire books on tenacity now that's being studied in university. Whereas you know that was it was just simply considered a cardinal virtue. Mm -hmm. um, it's a did. basic basic. Uh, Character virtue, um, hard being hardworking, um, tenacious, uh, uh, disciplined—all these, all these other words. That, these are things that were assumed to be positive traits. And I, and as you know, as time goes on, I find the greatest predictor of future success in young musicians is not innate talent, but it is these cardinal virtues of um, of, of character. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's, it's, that, it's much easier to teach somebody who has that figured out or who, has, who had that instilled in them or um, because I, I see the ones the really naturally talented people but who have some fatal flaw it might be um, an outsized ego or um, uh, maybe a hedonism or something where they, you know, they an, call nowadays an addictive personality and they just want to party and then it, it ends up being their undoing they end up imploding and um, distracting themselves, and so I was, I was extremely focused for, for a number of years, to, so I could at least um, get a really good foundation. Do you teach? Oh yes, all the time. And so, how do you, uh, or do you address this with your students, or do you just sort of um, observe them and meet them where they are? Do you try and encourage this sort of uh, tenacity? Absolutely. That that that's that's the foundation. Um, it, it's, it's it's mainly setting up their expectations for what they need to do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm working with a couple, very I have, I have a 12-year-old uh, coming in and his younger sibling, a, a seven-year-old coming in today, and um, so we're addressing that whole balancing act of um, of being what what in their case is mainly it's just igniting their fire getting them to love music and wanting to play all the time then you don't have to talk about discipline because it's <laughs> it's just it just naturally comes out there amen you know? so yeah. so yeah so so my question to people when they're not being disciplined when they don't want to practice is why are you doing this <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, mean, I know I, when, I remember when herseth finally retired after what 51 years in the chicago symphony some insane number mm -hmm. and then and then what does he do in his retirement when he's in his 80s he's playing with local bands <laughs> so what does what does that tell you yeah, yeah. that's right so uh, you, at uh, the age of 19, uh, you made a pretty major decision in terms of your uh, life path. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I altogether quit the trumpet, of all things, <laughs> because the thing that I loved so much about playing music, as I understood it at that point, was this, this sense of transcendental 
absorption. I would get so absorbed in the music and I would get this kind of floating feeling. And, uh, and I thought that that was a, a pure experience that I could investigate and cultivate through meditation. And that, so that was a growing interest of mine, the, the, the inner, what we call the inner game. Um, but I thought it was just so much more than that because for me, playing music was a spiritual experience and I, I could see it in other people and the, the way an entire audience would just come together into a, you know, um, they'd get into sync and just sort of have the shared experience. And so I was, I was really sure that that was the purpose of classical music was to uplift everybody. And, okay. and then at, at the same time, I was studying at New England Conservatory, which was... Uh, so the inside of the conservatory, that point was, you know, the, all the, the theory teachers and the um, various other instructors were very much against old-fashioned music. They were saying, you know, the, all, the, all the music that I loved the most was uh, passe, backwards. Um, we needed to move on to new, you know, new language, you know, the 12th tone or, or, or beyond. You know. So these were very much uh, composers and thinkers in the... Boulez neo Marxist camp where we needed to overturn uh, you know <laughs> western music and you know so there's that they're beating the drums of progress so then i was you know i had um, you know quite a philosophical <laughs> um, you know, i I found myself with the philosophers in the in the conservatory and I was actually in a class face to face with uh, um, a philosophy teacher from Harvard and no one else wanted to take this class. It was just me and one other student <laughs> and I was for two hours a week and we were talking the philosophy of aesthetics. And of course I couldn't hold my own against this teacher, but I knew she was wrong, but I just couldn't figure out why. But we, we, so we're, con we're constantly doing these, you know, this, you know, examining chapters by Theodore Adorno and um, Walter Benjamin and these other philosophers. So that was, you know, that was part of my you know, interest in philosophy, and I was after something else, and I, I knew instinctively that I wasn't going to find it at the conservatory, that there was something, the things that I loved about music were not being taught there, at least as far as I could see. Of course, now as an adult, I look back, so well, I, I certainly could have, you know, could have just simply ignored those people who I disagreed with. But at that point, I, I took it as a sign from above that I, I needed to get out of music. I was in the wrong place. It, was, it seemed so hoity-toity and um, I was much more visceral, instinctual kind of musician. So I actually moved into a yoga ashram at that point and spent four years in, not, play, in not playing the trumpet. Massachusetts or where? Yeah, yeah, west of Massachusetts, right just on the border of New York. And it was, a, it was an ashram that was being uh, put together right um, it was a smaller organization from Pennsylvania, and they found this old Jesuit monastery uh, that had been defunct for 30 years. And the Catholics, you know, just couldn't find enough people to go into the priesthood. So this thing was. So they bought these. Uh, these yogis bought this uh, this building for a song from the church, and, and so they all um, they were inviting people to come live with them in this communal situation, and. You know, you know, meditate and wake up at, yeah, wake up at four o'clock in the morning, meditate, do yoga, um, study Sanskrit scriptures and work 10 hours a day doing some type of physical labor. So I really liked that because I was, first of all, it was taking me further down the path of discipline. I was living an extremely ascetic, focused, um, simple life, you know, sleeping on the floor, eating bowls of rice. So I was really, you know, getting by on just the bare minimum and I and you know, really thriving and the, also I was uh, paying my own way I mean I, um, they pay us $20 a month and then everything else was taken care of so I didn't have to worry about um, supporting myself as much I, mean, I was supporting myself but I that was a part of the pressure of being in school even though I had a full scholarship to NEC it was still really expensive for me I didn't have money for living expenses and that was uh, even that was too, too expensive so you did that for, what, four years? Yeah, four years. And uh, the, well, i got a thousand questions. Oh, yeah, exactly, right? Where do you go? So you convinced your parents that the path that you're going to go on is to be a trumpet player. 
which oh. is a big shift for them. Well, I didn't <laughs> try to convince my parents. I was I was very much a, a free agent. Oh, I see. I was but where my father was. You know, old school Italian is the the girls you lock up in a in a, in a tower at home and you know keep to keep the boys away. But the boys, you throw them to the wolves. I so my see. father was you know since I was twelve, he said you know if you earn your own money, you can do whatever you want with it. I don't care. He didn't. He never tried to tell me what to do he said but he, he also told me kid you're on your own you're not you know i'm not supporting you and is, you know well certainly i was you know not getting support from home but that's i love that that's great it's, it's i think it's just uh our, our uh, certainly our, our sons an injustice by promising them unlimited support you know because then they, they do they come home and you know at age 35 and sleep in the basement you know with free cable and <laughs> Wi-Fi all stuff. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I was, and so my parents were wonderful in that they were very hands off and told me, how, really told me, you know, good luck. <laughs> so, so it was my own enterprise. Did they and, react at all when you? Oh, absolutely. My mother was in tears. She couldn't believe I threw away this incredible future that she saw that, I mean, first of all, they never really thought I was going to, you know, I don't know, amount to much because I was not, uh, I didn't show in any promise in anything other than music kind of late in the day so um then when i just turned my back on that and it was it was i just you know it, it made all the sense to me but at that point they were probably used to me um doing unusual things so <laughs> <laughs> what, what so what's a, a typical day uh just some random day you're 20 years old and it's uh yeah. may 7th mm -hmm. and you're doing what right okay wake up at 4 a.m and then do about an hour's worth of yoga postures and breathing exercise and then sit for an hour uh, doing more breathing exercises till uh, eventually these breathing exercises take you into really deep meditation and then that's about 6.30 then you eat a you know, bowl of rice and some vegetables or something and then I'd get to work in the kitchen I'd wash dishes or cook for the whole place um, which actually grew to about 200 people and sometimes on the weekends because of the guests that would come up this is you remember this is at the very beginning of the whole yoga explosion i mean it was yoga was just it was not a commonly used word it was, people confused it with yogurt and then uh, so then we had this whole had this whole thing um you know this this, this so these this group of yogis these were the early adopters you know they, the they were the and I was I was very much a youngster compared to them. They'd been you know they were all much older than I was. But I just you know, so they gave me you know easy you know, or not easy work, but they gave me menial work, yeah, simple menial work. They were, certainly weren't you know trusting with anything very difficult. And uh, I uh, you know I got to the, my my time there. I got to see how this very conservative um, religious practice, you know, meaning you know. All the very similar to any other monastic practice, where it's a, um, you know, it's it's self denial. It's 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 um, really focusing a person into a, um, you know, simply being focused on one's spiritual growth and negation of of the ego. Well, the whole New Age movement started to. Uh, creep into this place and everything you know the music started changing we listen to new age music and all the all the new ageisms and the people with the crystals and all you know all these other really flaky things started coming in and before my eyes i watched this transformation of this organization you know perfectly good people who had been um you know on the straight and narrow path and they uh, started to uh kind of lose it so the whole thing started to um, years after I left, the whole thing just uh, dissolved, and they sold it and turned it into a new age center. So it was no longer a yoga ashram. So they they bought some you know some investors bought the name, and you know they're selling all the health services and all the thing you know the, the spiritual shampoo and you know all these all, all the things. So, but it's it's, it's a very very different um, thing. So that was that was an important life lesson to watch with a certain you know. That um, that American culture of of uh, hippiness, you know, ha has on things because these, these really weren't hippies when, when I moved in. So when you left, was it because of that, or for? I mean, when? How, what was the arc of that? Oh, it was very simple. I just um, I just woke up one morning and said, you know what? I'm so good at this, at living in this ashram. I don't need to do it anymore. There's no point to doing it if it's if it's not a 
real stretch. So, okay, I need to live in the world. It would be much more of a challenge for me to live in the world and, um, you know, just try to you know, honor my own uh, spiritual ideals, um, you know, privately. And I, you know, I need to do something for a living. So I thought, what can I do for a living? Well, I, I'd been cooking for some years there, and I knew that cooking was really, really hard work. And they don't, and restaurants don't even pay the cooks very well. So what can I do? So maybe I could go back to music. But I mean, I was really, really out of shape. I, I was, it was just terrible. So, but I um, rented a cottage out in the woods from, uh, from a friend and just started practicing. Just started practicing my butt off. And it was terrible. I mean, it was just I couldn't play anything. You know, I really had to, um, you know, do a lot of catch up. What was great is because I was so into meditation, I, I had that whole side of things, you know, um, cultivated. That my learning curve was straight up at that mm. point, <laughs> and that's that's where I am. I am still convinced that meditation makes a person much more teachable and makes their learning uh, ability to learn new things. Accelerated. So, so I, what, I do the, the because of the lack of ego about it or judgment or, or what what exactly? It's the ability to put put one's ego aside and simply immerse oneself into whatever it is whatever is at hand. Fascinating. Yes, yeah, just absorption. So was that uh, that cabin in the woods? Was that also in the Berkshires? Yes. And what what town was that in? Stockbridge. Stockbridge. Huh. And when you were um, when you were studying uh, at the ashram, um, did did you get to any concerts at Tanglewood in the summer, or any of the other year-round art uh, that happens in the Berkshires, or were you just pretty much self-contained uh, for that those four years? No, I, I I did make it over for a few concerts. Not a lot of them because they were late at night, and that was well past my bedtime. I had sure. to wake up at four a.m. Right. and that was that's really, you know. Going to sleep at eight thirty most days, and so so if I if I was going to hear a concert, you know, so the Boston Symphony is going to play a big Mahler symphony. Oh, I got to hear it. You know, I'd go to it, but you know, next day it would be a wreck. Right. It became a big cost. And then at that point, I was it was just I was simply a music aficionado. That's right. all I was. I was just a fan at that point, and uh, so I didn't. It wasn't so dire that I hear these things. But yeah, there were some astonishing concerts to be heard. I remember hearing the complete Bartok string quartets with the Takash string quartet, the original members of the group. And these, my goodness, that was just hmm. astonishing. But they, wow. I mean, you're playing the whole thing by memory, <laughs> all six quartets. Good <laughs> goodness gracious. Yeah, I know. Because those trumpet players were so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we don't have their kind of problems. You know why they were able to do that? Spir- yeah. Spiritual shampoo. That's the key. Yeah, yeah, that's right. If you have the right <laughs> spiritual shampoo yeah. and, and crystals, uh, and so crystals, yeah. how how uh, what was the period of time between when you uh, went into the woods in Stockbridge and started practicing again until you started playing in when you won your job in Mexico? Oh, um, I it was about a year, a little under a year. I was just practicing, practicing, and I I was sure that this was not going to work out i was certain that i was never i was never gonna be a trumpet player and i was starting to think uh, you know okay i gotta figure out something else this is uh, uh, happily the new england conservatory gave me my full scholarship back so i could get ton uh, ton of trumpet lessons then um so that was very helpful i went back to schluter and took a bunch of lessons with him he was super helpful nice. um so how long I had, I, I had no face uh, right and then so this orchestra in Mexico, they were looking for a first trumpeter. They lost their whole trumpet section in one fell swoop. They had uh, they were on a tour in northern Mexico, and they um, the whole uh, the whole trumpet section ditched them. Apparently, the, the conductor was abusing them too much, and they, so they just all split. I think some of them even went went back to the U.S. or you know they went up. To, I don't know where they went, but wow. suddenly they had an emergency. So I get this call in the middle of the night. Because my, uh, they were looking for a trumpet player, and my name had come up when they were asking around who'd be willing to come down to Mexico. Well, yeah, <laughs> it'd be well, Gabalia would go down to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> he'll he'll go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That was that was a conversation that they had. Apparently, <laughs> well, we know this one guy. Yeah, he'd uh, he'd go to Mexico. <laughs> Uh, wow, what a uh, what an incredible story! 
<laughs> really, it's uh, it's uh, it probably doesn't seem as incredible to you because it's your story, but um, there's just, there's a lot of twists and turns to this. And and so at this point, how old were you when you won that job? You were you were twenty three. Goodness gracious, that's a lot. I had uh, practiced the tuba a bunch and gone to school uh-huh. by the age of twenty three. That was it. <laughs> Those were like yeah. the two things I had done, like which were kind of predictable for a lot of people can say that. So what a uh, what a story. So. Um, so fast forwarding here, um, uh, there's so much I'd love to find out more about your time in Israel and the culture there and everything. Mm-hmm. But um, one thing I want to make sure that uh, that I ask you about is that um, in uh, for the 2014-15 season, you were the principal trumpet of the Baltimore Symphony and you were the principal trumpet of the Oslo Philharmonic. How the heck did that work? Well, a miracle of scheduling. It's just all lined up. The scheduling gods were smiling upon me, and it just so happened that the also film had offered me the season because they had a, a player who was sick. And it, it turned, and it was not likely I was going to be able to get out, be able to just, uh, you know, on such short notice of the Baltimore Symphony schedule. However, all the major concerts that the Baltimore Symphony was playing happened to be on the the weeks that the uh, Oslo Philharmonic was doing, you know, maybe they're on vacation. They have tons of vacation, that orchestra. It's, it's such an easy schedule. They don't even play on weekends. They only play on Thursday and Friday. <laughs> so, there yeah, it's, it's awesome. They're always free on the weekends. It's for families, you know. Whereas, uh, <laughs> so it, it just all, it just kind of lined up. And, of course, you know, uh, so I, I just created a patchwork and negotiated between the two orchestras so I could be, you know, in both orchestras and then, then I had a dream season because I love just playing all that music back and forth I played Poem of Ecstasy twice in that season Jeez. both with Baltimore and with Oslo where we recorded it and did Heldenleben twice <laughs> um, did, I think did what four Mahler symphonies between the two orchestras and Jeez. Um, pictures and uh, you name it it was just one thing after another several Bruckner symphonies uh it, it was all it was wonderful. Was um, was that year? Was that was that taxing on your body and not just your face, but just with jet lag and being dehydrated oh, sure. from flying and all that? Was that would that have been sustainable if you had tried to do it for another year or two, or was it just kind of a one time sprint? Well, I had had a lot of practice doing that with the Israel Philharmonic. Sure, we were on we were on so many tours each year. You mm-hmm. do a South America tour every other year. You know, Japan every year, U.S. every year. We go to Europe. Um, of course, that wasn't very far away from Israel, so there wasn't so much jet lag. But yeah, I was I was no stranger to, you know, that the kind of topsy turvy schedule. But yeah, it's um, it was too, it was too much of a good thing, and it's uh, it's good that I don't have to do that every year. Do you mind if we jump to the uh, Future Symphony Institute? I'd like. Oh, I'd be I'd be uh, happy to. Yeah. Yeah. Can you uh, well, for anyone who's listening who isn't familiar with it, uh, why don't you tell oh. us what it is? Well, my when I came to the Baltimore Symphony, it was an orchestra that was very much on the upswing. They had everything going for it. They were going to build a second hall in D.C. and they, I thought I had, had really picked uh, um, a great organization to get on the ground floor with. You know, it was, uh, you know, about to really turn into a terrific organization. And it certainly had a very fine reputation from David Zinman's years. And at that point, Temerkanov was a conductor. So I was ready to join an American orchestra. I'm not even Jewish. So, you know, living in Israel for a you know, prolonged period was not really in the cards. And uh, so when I came here, the, the, the whole, uh, um, during my t- time in Baltimore, I started to watch the whole thing just get unhinged, going right. to mass, massive deficits. And I was uh, on various committees watching this happen, and it was it was just a disaster, one thing after another. And what it became what cl- became clear to me was that what was ailing the Baltimore Symphony was the same thing that was ailing all the orchestras in the U.S., which was a combination of severe mismanagement, a board that didn't really understand what it was that they were trustees of, because they didn't they didn't really grasp how it you know, what it represented or um, how it behaved as a market offering. And then you had, of course, you had the musicians and their union and they were, they would dig their heels in on certain things and other things they were, um, they would let happen. And, uh, um, it's, and it's not equally weighted across all those groups, but I, um, 
but I saw that it was a complicated problem. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if there were a think tank that brought together all the best minds from outside of nonprofit arts group think to work on all these discrete problems that classical music faces because there's there's a lot of things going on with it and it's solvable but it, it it's just complicated and so that's i've been working for the last 13 years to build this organization we launched a year and a half ago it's going incredibly well for how little money we've raised for it um we have major initiatives with notre dame school of architecture coming duke university divinity school um baylor university is having us come in for an entire week next year um, and, and so what we do is we focus on not on the music schools, but on the other departments within universities to um, to look at specific issues that classical music faces. Because it turns out that we share a lot of the same problems as all these other art forms and other um, disciplines. So we're not we're not alone in our problems, but we sure act like we are. We, we really feel like we are. At times, like we're, it's this, this is thing unique to classical music that we can never overcome, and uh, so in our organization, we've we've defined the the problems that classical music faces in a way that I don't believe has been framed before, at least within the nonprofit arts world. So, so that, that I think that's the value that we bring to the whole thing. It is, it is something very different, although not original. There's nothing original about what we're doing. Uh, it's just. Uh, and, and many times I feel like I'm just pointing out the obvious. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about one, uh, you can pick, I don't care which, mm -hmm. but some one particular uh, area of the universe that you're trying to make an impact on, one specific area? Well, I think we can look at the business world and see that the most successful businesses know who their customer is and they ignore everybody else and that they're fine with that. Even Apple computers, which we all consider a giant, you know, uh, one of the most, certainly one of the most valuable companies on the stock exchange, and they don't have a majority share in any category in technology. It's all tiny slivers, maybe not tiny, but these are all small slivers of this huge technology sector. But they know their particular customer so well, and this, they, um, it was through enhancing the user experience and um, having amazing customer service and building relationships long term, changing the entire value proposition of the of the technology itself, what people were buying when they paid. And people are paying, you know, what double, triple what you'd have normally pay for a um, for, take a laptop, for example. It was the same circuit, same motherboard, all the same stuff on the inside, yet the experience of using it was so different. And they had set up something that were, that really set them apart. So Apple Computers is a really good example. And they're, they're perfectly fine not getting the whole world to use their, their computers. They don't care. And they, they want to keep growing. They, but they're not, trying, they're not looking for world domination. Whereas in the classical music world, we are held to a standard that we must get everybody to come to classical music concerts. Everybody. It's not okay if, you know, all these other people don't come. And we were... And so we end up getting nobody because <laughs> we're trying to get everybody. We, we refuse to acknowledge that there are only you know, one or two percent of the entire population that have even have a, a chance of rather um, that we even have a chance of engaging. And so are you looking for ways to engage them or you're looking for I mean, you, you're sort of trying to change the whole thing, aren't you? Um, Not what, necessarily, well, a, a lot of it's coming back down to basics. Um, but it's, um, you know, there, a, that, that's just one example of the, the, the things you had, you had sure, asked sure. me to, to focus sure. on. And that's, it is complicated. There's a lot of different issues at work. But, but we, you, you can get the whole thing purring along in a more sustainable um, way. Well, and there's probably no one-size-fits-all. I mean, not really. But the, there are the solution there in Baltimore are, are may not work in Detroit and it may not work in Pittsburgh. So. Right, but there are market principles that we're going to try to teach. Well, and what do you? How do you respond to uh, the? I would guess that one of the books that gets thrown at you on a regular basis is Baumol, and and the notion that it takes the same number of people to. There's no ability to scale that. I mean, it's the same number of players the day the. Yeah, right. Baumol's cost disease. That that is that is a problem. 
and that we have to acknowledge that that's true. You know, some of the people in the union wanted to say that that wasn't uh, necessarily valid, but that you know that stands. But we just have to keep um, working against that. What we have to do is keep figuring out a way to push the ticket prices higher. <laughs> that then people they lose their minds when you say that. But we're charging too little for the tickets. That that's one of them. But why would people pay more? if they didn't value it more. And the reason why they're not willing to pay more is because they don't value it. Well, how do, how do we get people to value the concert experience more? And, and then how do we get in, by dint of that, if they value what we're doing so much more, they'd be willing to also donate to us. <laughs> are, there any, um, are there any symphonies uh, or uh, organizations in any other disciplines that uh, you point to as, as doing any of these various aspects particularly well today? Yeah, Cleveland Orchestra seems to do everything right. They mm-hmm. get it. Um, they should, sometimes, once in a while, they show signs that they're about to jump the shark on something. But they, 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 they're an example. They're in a really tough city to move classical music, and yet they're just <laughs> just killing it. Right. So that's why it's interesting. It's not, what's not interesting to me is what they're doing in New York or L.A., because those markets are just so lucrative. I, don't even, I don't, can't even begin to imagine how you fail in those places. Because there's just so much money. But you're Cleveland, you know, everybody's vacating the city center, and um, it's, it's such a, they have so many problems there. You're just, they're competing with all these other types of charity. Do you, what's your take on, I mean, it seems, well, it doesn't seem, if you look at the numbers, earned income goes down basically every year. I mean, the, the, the percentage that orchestras make on ticket sales. Um, has been in a steady decline for decades, and do you? Well, you no, know, the, the earned income has always stayed around thirty-five uh, percent. Well, it, 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 if you look at over the last hundred years, I think it's it, it shows a decline. I mean, uh, but you feel like over the last what period it's stabilized? Oh, my, last several decades, it's okay. stabilized at about at about a third. But everything else is moving around. It's the. Uh, um, getting large gifts that's been a, a really big challenge you're, you're sure. not, so now you have to work much harder to get lots of small gifts so you need a lot more development staff and then you have to really diversify your offerings to try to um, you know that, that, that's one way of approaching it I guess I was uh, heading back to your notion that one of the things to do is to raise ticket prices which you know I think that that has from what I've read it has mixed um uh, results. In some instances, it causes fewer people to come, and in other instances, it causes lots more dollars to come through the door. So, how well, do you it, know? How do you know what to well, do? Well, that that is that is a complicated formula. That's not simple thing. You can't raise prices just like that. There's a way, there's a way of you have to increase something else that you're offering that makes people more willing to pay more for it. Uh, you know, that, that part of it is marketing. Part part of it is the um, the real substance of what you're offering. So that that that's a big conversation. Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, God bless you for taking this on. I mean, this is a a huge uh, m- machine you're trying to tinker with. As it stands now, my wife and I went to hear the National Symphony play Bruckner Seven with Eschenbach. This Eschenbach makes two point four million dollars a year. National Symphony, their base is one hundred twenty or so. Yet we only paid twelve dollars for each of our tickets. The mm-hmm. hall was one third full, and that uh, the week before I'd taken her to the movies, and our movie tickets were about eighteen dollars each at one of those landmark theaters. So you tell me, should the price of hearing Brooker Seven with Christoph Eschenbach and a top orchestra be less than going to a movie? Well, it depends. I mean, not to be a pain in your butt, but. <laughs> it depends on what the goal is, and if the goal is to get people to try it out, then lowering the prices is a an easy way to try and make that happen. If the goal is to identify, as you said, like who are the one to two percent of the population who are way into this and will be willing to pay six dollars for a cup of coffee and more than happy to pay fifty bucks for a ticket, um, yeah. so it just depends on what the end goal is, right? Well, I suppose, yeah, to get people just to sample something, um, yeah, you get to pretty much just give them a ticket and pray that they're even going to accept your free ticket. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's for sure. Um, 
but the overall valuation of it. I mean, look, people are going to you know Jay Z concerts for for two hundred dollars all the time. Yeah, Hamilton, you, you, what six seven hundred yeah. bucks for a Hamilton ticket? Oh sure, okay, there you go. So so we need to be playing in that in that territory. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it's it, it it seems like it's uh, you know that that most orchestras of late have been trying to do the you know the expanding of the audience base uh you know to get more people in the door to increase revenue which it seems like isn't working all that well so that doesn't mean that they doesn't mean that they've been doing it the right way um but uh but it certainly hasn't been working all that well so um yeah there's just so many so many issues to unpack here i think it's i think it's pretty cool that you're tackling this yeah that's pretty great yeah well there's a way of satisfying both issues you know you, you want to have people who are paying full freight that really uh, prices that reflect the cost of it and increases the sense of valuation mm -hmm. but at the same time you're, you're not trying to gouge people who are truly um strapped like students or the working poor um but this um this idea that we're going to flatten out the ticket prices and make the whole thing um unsustainable that's just well just plain unsustainable <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's uh why, why, why are we no business is run for the benefit of their simply of the the customers to its own detriment sure no at it's least it's not for so long it's, it's not for long yeah. precisely yeah. so this is what we we don't we're not uh, applying this kind of common sense to orchestras and of course then you know then you have the people you know i'm certainly not the first person to make these, these observations because I, I always think i'm pointing out the obvious but you have you know board members who come in they come in from some type of you know, experience in some business venture, and they um, they apply the wrong for-profit business principles to the orchestra. They they think of it as a widget factory, right. and that's where that's where the musicians start to lose their minds. <laughs> you know, oh my God, they think <laughs> we're not we're not making donuts here, or widgets. We're you know, it, it's a different kind of thing. So that's placing one's finger precisely on what we are in the market is is what. What our organization is doing, and then it, we don't behave like other things. We're not widgets. Hmm. How so, should? But, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask: uh, How should musicians uh, arm themselves? What What should they be reading? How should they educate themselves? What should they be thinking about, talking about, hmm. to change, to make a change? Other than reading the pieces on the Future Symphony Institute, <laughs> uh, those website. without saying. Well, yeah, that's the <laughs> and thing. listening we, to our we, podcast. We we do massive amounts of reading so that we can um, boil it all down into easy-to-read essays, because most people don't have that kind of time. Um, I would, I mean, the, the type of things that we, I wish musicians would read would be, um, you know, authors like uh, Russell Kirk and Roger Scruton, who, um, who wrote on a, a, a type of conservatism, which is not the conservatism that we associate with the, um, the Republican Party and all this you know, horror is going on. You know, it's not political. It, the point is conserving traditions that are good. I mean, not everything has to be improved upon. My my iPhone improves every year, but the, the, but there are certain things that don't need to be improved upon. that have, need to be preserved, and that's what um, you know, true conservatism is. You know, cultural conservatism. Um, it, it's really hard to top the type of painters we saw during the Renaissance. It, it just reached an incredible apex. Um, so art, I think to understand art as a progress is a misunderstanding. Um, art is something that is constantly being added onto, and we should understand our art form as something where we, yeah, there's always more music. We have new music, and that's wonderful. And some of these new pieces turn out to be real winners, and we start playing them over and over. But they're not better because they're new. <laughs> they're just, it's just more art, more music. Here's a, uh, uh, this is just sort of a fixation of mine. Um, <clears throat> let's take the NFL as an example. You, you can experience the NFL um, live and you can experience it via portable media and you can right. experience it TV uh, or in a sports bar. And we've really kind of locked the gates down um, in terms of our art. And yeah. what's your take on that? Good idea, bad idea? How well, should change I, I don't think there's much it. demand for it online, unless you're the Berlin Philharmonic. Um, they, they've they've turned that into a real bonanza. Um, I, I wish we could have more of a following. You know, there's other types of media. I think 
giving away recordings for free all all the, at this point because people aren't willing to pay for them. That's fine as long as people are getting classical music in their ears, and then we can try to sell them the live thing, um, persuade them. You know, we have, but it's always going to be about cultivating a long-term relationship with people. It's not just simply transactional. Buy a ticket and leave. We want to make friends with these people. Um, like I said, there's not that many people who are in a place in their lives or who, are, who have the inner resources to um, really invest themselves in classical music. And, that's, and, and, it all, and it changes for people from during different periods of their life. You know, if they're raising children, they don't have time or interest to do those things. But then when the kids grow up and leave the home, lo and behold, they look back, well, well there's some other things I wish I, were, I had done. I wish I'd learned photography and I wish I knew something about classical music. And then that's when we should be ready for them. But to, to be all things to all people just doesn't make any sense. I was uh, talking to the father of a friend of mine who was an executive at J.C. Penney. And I asked him, you know, I, I, knew, I knew what I thought of J.C. Penney. I didn't have very high esteem of it. And so I was kind of sheepishly asking, no, no pun intended. I asked him, <laughs> um, so, um, so what's the, who's the target mar- audience for your target market for J.C. Penney? Oh, Hispanic girls under 25. Whoa! What really? Bang. He said, "Yeah, bang." He said he make he said J C Penney makes all the money on the crappy hoop earrings and all the stuff right when you go in. All that that really cheap jewelry and those little, um, you know, things that uh, fifteen year old uh, couples exchange between themselves. Like you know, you have a, a heart, you know, that's in half or something. You wear half a heart. That's where they make all their money. He said everything else is sell at at cost. <laughs> they just want to. Move. They have huge margins on that junk jewelry. That's pretty. They know they knew exactly who they're after, right. and they've they sustained them. There's been massive, massive changes in um, the department store world, and J.C. Penney is so far they're going okay. I mean, every their whole world changed, but they adapted. Hmm. But they, they acknowledge who their what their niche was. Unfortunately, classical music doesn't have to accept that. That we, we're a niche offering. We're never going to be like Lady Gaga you know, um, with huge mass youth appeal. That's the last thing we should uh, no, but try don't you to think, do. I mean, I, I guess I, I feel like if we don't give people more ways to more entry points, mm-hmm. we're in trouble. And, and m- there can't be that many yeah. people watching some of these. I got 9,000 channels on my TV and there right. can't be that big of an audience uh, for a lot of those things. Or look at streaming or look at live uh, uh, broadcast or podcast. So, can't we make it easier using technology? And it, uh, to me, it seems like we're we're really in trouble if we keep the doors locked. And the only way you can experience it oh. is to get a babysitter and get in the car and go down there and pay whatever we agree on, oh, and, and okay. clap when you're supposed to and not when you're not. And then as soon as you get home, we're going to call you and hit you up to give us more money <laughs> back. You no, know, it just seems like. I go back to the football thing. I can tune in or not tune in. And if I don't know anything about football, then I watch a season of it. And then maybe I get interested. And then the next year, maybe I want to go down and and check it out. Well, you know, as much as we could, we're all trying to have an Internet presence to get in front of people. Then the people click on through. Um, It's tough. You know, the the Internet is just this wild west. It's all everything on the Internet is a lie. Anyhow, people are just so jaded to the Internet. So I don't know what's after the Internet. Or what the next, you know, stage is going to be. Um, I, I, um, I, I think that all those things are, you say are true. It, it could could help, but classical music trades on authenticity. And anytime we try to join the world of inauthenticity, where we um, we just become another, we just become part of the, the whole noise going on. I see. I don't. I, I don't see it that way. I mean, I, I think there's not we can have a perfect version of uh, name the piece and you can listen to it with the best headphones you can buy and for Mm -hmm. me in particular that i would much rather have that experience Mm -hmm. than to leave my house to go get that experience so that is every bit as rich and important and intense for me as it is for others to go down there and experience it live in a space with other people so Mm -hmm. but we what do you do for the the others? Well, I, I look at the others who are, who are one of us. <laughs> There's ways of finding these people. 
as, as, well, we're, our point is with our work is that there's this huge population of people who have not been to classical music concerts, yet they're just on the cusp. They're so close. You look at all their other habits, all their other interests, and they were, it would be so easy to persuade. And there's actually a term for that called the persuadables. It's been, it's been talked about in uh, arts research, the persuadables. But then like, like most research, they get close, but then they turn back at the moment of victory because they don't like the answer. Um, that they're oh. seeing so, but, well, but, but I, I, I'm I'm actually going to need to go because my my wife needs to be back with the sheep. So, <laughs> man, if I had a dollar for every time one of our guests said that, can you uh, can you super quickly give some advice uh, to our dear friend Jens Lindemann and these uh, horrible chop problems that he's going through? Oh, I know. I really feel for him, man. It was it's, it must have been terrible. I mean, I don't know. I I don't know if I have any advice because I know even when I came out of the ashram after not playing for four years, it was, it was never as bad as what Jens is going through. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He didn't even sound that bad after taking four years off uh, to experiment with spir- spiritual shampoo. So, um, <laughs> exactly. yeah, the uh, boy, all of this Future Symphony Institute stuff. I would really implore everybody to go check it out. It's a great site. It's a great resource source there's it's really well done stuff there's a monthly newsletter that i've signed up for uh, that you should check out and that's at uh, futuresymphony.org and is there anywhere else that people can find you online andrew that's it right, right. there uh, and your website andrewbalio.com as well so and we that's will right. I'm uh, still, I'm still building that yep. yeah i need to put some content on that yep. but uh, we'll uh, we'll link to those uh, in the show notes and uh Man, we could talk to you for a long time about all this stuff because both Lance and I are way interested in it, and it's really wonderful that you're um, that you're doing, you know, that you're tackling all of these very complex issues. It's a lot easier to not tackle them than it is to tackle them, but sure. it's it's so important. So it's, uh, it's a lot it's, of complaining in the lounge that happens, and there's not a lot of action like what you guys are doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Precisely. So, yeah. Well, well put. All well, right. Well, th- thank you so much for yeah. asking such good questions, guys. Yeah, of course. And please uh, thank your wife for uh, loaning us, uh, uh, <laughs> loaning, <laughs> loaning us to you. No, that no, that didn't come out right. Loaning you yeah. to us for the hour. So yeah, if she's still speaking to me. Uh oh, there you go. So all right. Well, that does it for another episode of the Brass Jones. <laughs> You've been listening to The Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to help support the podcast in order to make more episodes like this one possible, please visit pedalnotemedia.com slash donate for more details. Also, be sure to check out our latest recording, The Brass Recording Project, at brassrecordingproject.com. The Brass Junkies is produced by Austin Boyer and Buddy Deschler of the Fredericksburg Brass Institute. Executive producers are Andrew Hitz and Lance LaDuke. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.